The tide may be turning against the Biden administration as photos emerge from so-called migrant detention facilities. So how much longer can the White House continue to blame the Trump administration for what is obviously an issue that the Biden administration created? Friends, it's time for Hold the Line. Welcome to Hold the Line, I'm Buck Sexton. We knew that it was gonna keep getting worse. In fact, we told you here the situation on the border would continue to get worse because we understand the incentive structure that's in place for the migrants, for the cartels, and yes, for the Democrat Party. We know what's going to happen because we understand the parties involved and what they want to get out of this. None of them want this to stop entirely. The Democrats just want to prevent this from spiraling so far out of control that we have images to show, footage of what these detention facilities look like, and you are seeing them now. This isn't a time of a global pandemic, by the way. That seems like there's not a lot of social distancing going on there, is there? But this is the situation we find ourselves in because the Biden administration came into office and just that very reality created a widespread perception among illegal immigrants in places like Central America that if they come here, they have a very good shot of just skipping the whole immigration process and staying in America forever. And that's a very valuable thing. Now, at first, the Democrats were trying to, and the Biden administration specifically, trying to tell us it wasn't a crisis. And we know it actually is a crisis. So that's starting to just get pathetic and obvious in a way that won't hold water anymore. But what about why this is happening? What is the cause of the current crisis? When you dig into that for a moment, you see very clearly that everybody who's involved knows it's Joe Biden. Here is Martha Raddatz over at, uh, I think, ABC, I get those networks confused, sitting or talking to, she's standing up, talking to a migrant about what's going on, why did you arrive? Here's what the migrant said. Would you have tried to do this when Donald Trump was president? Definitely not. Definitely. We had the chance, you know, the, the same violence that is going on today was there last year. We used to watch the, the news and uh, I definitely won't do this. So did you come here because Joe Biden was elected president? Basically. Basically. Yeah. Would you come here when Trump? No, of course not. There was still the same situation in that man's home country. But he wouldn't have come here to the Trump administration because the perception was, understandably, that there was, a less, uh, there was a lesser chance of being able to stay in the country permanently. Would you do this? Uh, did you do this now because Joe Biden is president? Basically, yeah. That's what the guy says. Basically, yes. How many more times do we have to hear this before it's absurd and actually insults our intelligence when Biden and the other Democrats pretend that this has nothing to do with the fact that you have a new Democrat administration with a president who at one point raised his hand on stage during the presidential debate saying that illegal immigrants should get free health care in America. Okay, as if that's not an inducement in and of itself. Uh, I mentioned before to you the situation in these facilities, which now the, the footage makes it all quite clear, is dire. I mean, it's bad. These are people who are being held in very close quarters. You see here, we're at a time of COVID, so this is particularly uh, dangerous. You know, we, we know that if this were a different circumstance and there were photos of people in this cl in close quarters, let I me mean, look at this, in close quarters like this, we also know that there is a, high, a, a pretty high percentage of some of the migrants tested have had COVID uh, or, or are positive with COVID. This is a real concern and the White House has got to deal with this too. So here's what uh, Jen Psaki says about it. What is his concern about this being a super spreader event where you've got 400 uh, uh, kids stuffed into a pod built for 260. These kids are tested. Uh, if they need to be quarantined, they are quarantined. We also follow CDC guidelines to ensure that they are kept safe. One of the reasons that it took us some time to uh, have some of these facilities or some of the shelters open to larger groups of kids is because we wanted to follow those CDC guidelines. So we certainly don't see it through that prism. We actually took the steps we did to keep these kids safe. Yes, just the CDC guidelines, of course. I wonder if they're double masking all these kids, because as we know, that's what Dr. Fauci, as of two months ago, says is the smartest thing you can do for this. I'm guessing not. But nonetheless, two sets of rules, as we know, two different approaches to all of this, depending on which administration is in charge. 
And that's really where this all comes down now. That's where you see the Democrats, their final act here. And, and this, or I should say their last ditch effort, because they've been doing this all along. But now they've really started to lay into, as we see how bad this is, as we see what a, a catastrophe this is, two months in the Biden presidency, oh, that's right, it's the Trump administration's fault. Here's the DHS secretary making that case. We are executing uh, on our plan. It does take time. It is difficult. Uh, our plan includes the deployment of the Federal Emergency Management Administration, FEMA, to assist HHS in building its capacity more rapidly to shelter the children. But it is taking time and it is difficult because the entire system was dismantled by the prior administration. There was a system in place in both Republican and Democratic administrations that was torn down uh, during the Trump administration. And that is why the challenge is more acute than it ever has been before. That is a deeply dishonest rewriting of history at our southern border from Mayorkas, which shouldn't surprise you at all, but I just wanted to be very clear about that. The Trump administration had to make changes because the immigration system that it inherited had a massive loophole for people claiming asylum, if, especially if they showed up with an unaccompanied minor uh, in the, you know, it, it, next to them. There was a, a huge problem the Trump administration had to, had to focus on and fix. They fixed that issue because if you view the problem as people skipping the immigration process and flooding to our border, coming in illegally and then trying to stay by gaming the asylum process, fixing it means stopping them from wanting to do that. The Democrats, on the other hand, play this game where they say, no, the problem is really just that people who are coming to do that aren't being processed fast enough, so they're filling up these facilities. That's a different look at this problem. That's a different way of approaching all of this, but there's no surprise they are blaming Trump and pretending that when he fixed a problem, he is now the cause of their problem. When if you wanna talk about dismantling, the ending of Remain in Mexico policy, the, uh, the change in tone about interior enforcement, about deportations, all the things, it just, it's obvious, Biden looks like an open borders guy when he talks about this stuff. When he was running on the campaign trail, it was obvious. People watching could see. Uh, then there's also the fact that you're, you watching this right now, you're paying with your tax dollars for uh, hotel rooms for illegal aliens. So that's right, ho hotel rooms. They're gonna spend $80 million plus to secure hotel rooms for migrant families now to Southern border. So you're paying for their healthcare, their food, their schooling, and, and the, the hotel rooms now that they're going to be uh, living in. So that's, that's how much the Biden administration believes in, uh, in law and order and a secure border. There you go. This new order removes all of our county mask mandates and allows businesses to operate at full capacity without state imposed rules or restrictions. Two weeks ago, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves became one of only a handful of governors to give Americans their power back, lifting statewide mask mandates and letting businesses reopen. That's not the only good news for Mississippians. Yesterday, the state opened COVID vaccination appointments to all residents 16 years and older, with Governor Reeves tweeting, get your shot, friends, and let's get back to normal. Amen to that. So how's Mississippi doing since fully reopening, and why haven't other states followed suit? Well, let's ask the man of the hour himself. Governor Tate Reeves joins us now. Governor, thanks so much, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me on today. I remember early on here, after you announced that you were reopening right alongside the, uh, the announcement from Texas, there were some folks in the media and the Democrat party in particular that referred to this as Neanderthal thinking. I think it might have even been the president himself. What do you have to say based on how, it's, how the reopen has gone and what the numbers look like so far? Well, I will tell you when the president uh, called all of us in middle America Neanderthals. I couldn't help but uh, be reminded of when Hillary Clinton called uh, all of us deplorables. It just That's exactly what came to mind. But the reality is things are going very well. We peaked about two and a half months ago at 2,400 cases per day for a seven-day average. We had 350 cases today. We've had less than 1,000 cases over the last four days. And so our numbers have plummeted. Our numbers of new cases has plummeted, but more importantly than that, 
Our total number of hospitalizations has plummeted. We peaked at 1,444. Today we're at 280. So we're down over 80% in hospitalizations. And after all, that's really what we've been focused on here in, in our state. While number of cases is worth looking at and it's important, what's really important is that we ensure that we protect the integrity of our healthcare system. And so we watch hospitalizations, we watch number of patients in ICU beds. Our number of patients in ICU beds peaked at 370. Uh, today we're down uh, less than 100. Again, so, down over 80%. So all these numbers trending in, in the, the residents of Mississippi's favor in a big way, which is great news. What did the reopen mean? What are the things that have changed in your state? So, so folks that are watching this across the country can also get a sense of what have you done that hasn't resulted in a, a surge, as Dr. Fauci and others likes to constantly warn us about, but actually you still have a continued downtrend here. What, what are the things that have changed, uh, Governor? Well, we never had a statewide mask mandate in Mississippi, at least dating back to the end of last summer. What we did have is countywide mandates based upon an objective criteria, which basically said that if any particular county in our state, we have 82, if any of them had more than 200 cases or and or more than 500, 500 per 100,000 residents, then we instituted a countywide mandate. Now, at the peak, that got up to where not all, but many of our counties uh, had those mandates. We took all of those off because that's what the data showed. You know, uh, folks like um, the liberals in Washington want us to focus on the science and focus on the data when the numbers are going up, but they want us to ignore that when the numbers start coming down. And that makes absolutely no sense to us. And so what we've seen is that we've opened up um, to full capacity, our restaurants, our bars, there are no restrictions on any of them. The only restrictions we have left in our state, we have no restrictions, by the way, on outdoor stadiums, uh, which is really important here because we have two of the top five college baseball programs in America, and it is not unusual for us to get 10,000 Mississippians in a college baseball stadium for a college game on the weekends. So that's uh, no restrictions there. The only restrictions we have left are on indoor large venues, and we currently are limiting them to 50%. But as we see more and more trends of the total cases going down, while at the same time total number of vaccinated going up, I would expect us to, to really move to absolutely no restrictions um, very, very soon. Governor, what, given what you've seen since the removal of restrictions and the downward trend, and now you can look back, as you said, at the data over the course of the pandemic for Mississippi over the last 12 months, would you think long and hard before going back into a state of lockdown? Do, do you think differently at all about some of the restrictions that were CDC recommended over the last year and that many states went into now that you've actually gone through 12 months of the pandemic and seen what the data says about what works and doesn't? Well, there's, there's no doubt that we better understand what works and what doesn't work today. Uh, I will tell you that in our state, we basically had no major shutdown. Uh, we did have a shelter in place order for a couple of weeks dating back uh, to, to April of last year. Uh, but the fact is our economy has been back open. It's the reason when you look at our, our total unemployment, for instance, we're in the top five in the nation in terms of jobs recovered this month compared to where we were a year ago in the, in the heat uh, of the transition. But there's no doubt that we know more now and, and many of those uh, governors in the West Coast and the East Coast that have had their economies shut down for months and months, um, I think hopefully they could even look at it and say that perhaps that was a bad decision. Another bright spot in your fight against this pandemic is vaccinations. You're now the second state after Alaska to open up vaccinations to all residents. How'd you get there? What worked in this process that now you can open it up so everybody can get vaccinated? Because that's where we all want to be able to go. That's where the whole country is trying to go. No doubt. Uh, by this weekend, we will have one million shots in arms in Mississippi. Uh, of, of that number, we started uh, based upon the highest risk categories where there was, there was a, a debate early on and, and some particularly again, those in, in Washington wanted to focus on who was more important or who should get it and who shouldn't get it. Well, we started very early saying the most at-risk people in our state 
are those 65 and older. The reason for that is because 90% of our fatalities during the life of COVID have come from those that are 65 and older. And so uh, right now we have approximately 60 to 65% of all Mississippians over 65 that have gotten their first shot. Uh, we've gotten almost 50% of all Mississippians over the age of 50 that have gotten their first shot. And the way in which we've done it in large part is because we have mass vaccination sites, uh, approximately 19 of them situated in every region of our state. Uh, we have deployed hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of Mississippi National Guardsmen. And in conjunction with our partners at the State Department of Health and the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, uh, just at those mass vac sites, we're able to put approximately 40,000 shots in arms uh, per week. Those are for first dose appointments and another 30 to 40,000 uh, per week for second doses. And because of that, we've been very successful at getting shots in arms. And it's something that I'm very proud of. I'm proud that everybody in our state that wants a shot can get a shot. I believe in personal responsibility. And, and when you uh, allow Mississippians to make their own decisions, it also allows you to open things up more quickly because um, people are going to make the best decision for themselves and their families. Governor Reese, you also signed a bill banning transgender uh, female athletes from competing in female sports. And you tweeted out, I never imagined dealing with this, but POTUS left us no choice. One of his first acts was to sign an EO encouraging transgenderism in children. So today I proudly signed the Mississippi Fairness Act to ensure young girls are not forced to compete against biological males. Uh, how, how is this going to work in practice and, and uh, how do you think this is going to be viewed in the rest of the country? Well, I don't know how it's gonna be viewed in the rest of the country, but I do know how it's gonna be viewed in, in my state. And it is overwhelmingly the popular and the right thing to do. I have three daughters myself, 116, 114, and 19. And I never envisioned or never imagined when I ran for governor of Mississippi that you and I would be having this conversation today. But the only reason we're having this conversation is because the president of the United States, President Biden, decided on one of his very first days in office and one of his very first actions was to try to ensure that biological males took away opportunities for young girls in our state. And we believe uh, that that particular executive order actually encourages transgenderism. That's bad policy for America, and it's particularly bad policy for the state of Mississippi. And that's why we were proud to be one of the first states with overwhelming support uh, to, to get this bill done. Governor Reeves. Thanks very much for your time. Good luck to you. Last week, eight people were killed when a lone gunman went on a shooting spree in three Atlanta area spas. Six of those murdered were Asian women, two were not. And although the FBI had zero evidence of, uh, the event was a hate crime, some on the left believe the fatal shootings were, in fact, racially motivated. Here is Illinois Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth. Well, from where I sit, I want to see a deeper investigation into whether or not these shootings and other similar crimes are racially motivated. It looks racially motivated to me, uh, but I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a police officer. I'm not investigating the crimes. Others on the left and in the mainstream media are taking it one step further, blaming Asian hate crimes on white supremacy. Take a look at these headlines. How white supremacy fuels black Asian tensions in America. White supremacy and hate are haunting Asian Americans, and from the school newspaper of the University of Washington, how white supremacy racist myths fuel anti-Asian violence. But is the woke left really a friend to the Asian community? Our next guest says, absolutely not. She joins us now to discuss. We've got political and social commentator Lauren Chen with us now. Lauren, thanks so much for being with us. For sure. Thank you for having me. So what do you make now that we're obviously spending a, a lot of time talking about mass shootings, motivations behind them. We've had two in two weeks. Uh, what do you make of the initial analysis that was coming out of most of the media after the Atlanta shootings? Well, first I want to say that, of course, any type of prejudice or bigotry is wrong. And then if you add violence into the mix, it's even more tragic. But I've got to say, I. I'm sorry, I don't really buy a lot of this moral posturing that we're seeing from the left on behalf of the Asian community. For the longest time, we have seen the left actually push measures that directly hurt Asians, and I'm talking about things like affirmative action. If you're an Asian student applying to a high school or a college, you have a much 
smaller chance of getting in than if you were a different race. It's literally a systemic racial discrimination that we've seen being pushed on, on behalf of progressives. And not only that, uh, the violence against Asians has been on the rise for, for quite a while now. But we see that it seems when, when the perpetrators of these hate crimes are frankly non-white, and we have seen quite a few of these attackers be from the black community, the media just pushes it aside and doesn't address it. So it kind of seems like the left is only in defense of Asians when it's politically convenient for them. Yes, and, and to that end, I've, I've even seen the term referring to Asians from analysts uh, and people in the media, white adjacent, which I will say was, was new, but this is how some particularly woke leftists will, refu- or will refer to the Asian community. They'll say that they're white adjacent when it comes to things like the highest per capita household income in the country, which belongs to Asian Americans, actually not white Americans, when it comes to admissions and the, uh, the negative effects of, of, uh, of affirmative action or kind of anti-affirmative action effects, that would be against the Asian community more so than the white community. Uh, what, does, what does white adjacent really mean? Well, it essentially means that Asians dispel the oppression narrative that the left has spun for all minorities. So, you know, instead of trying to reevaluate their worldview in order to match the facts, they would rather just throw Asians under the bus. Uh, Asians get called, uh, like you said, white adjacent. They 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 claim that we're we have proximity to whiteness. It's all very bizarre. I've been called a pet minority before, and essentially it, it, it's just to make up for the fact that Asians are successful, right? Because otherwise, if Asians like they in fact do have a higher per capita uh, income than white Americans, it, it seems hard to call America a white supremacist country. So instead, they would rather believe that Asians are just white bootlickers, which I have also been called, and it's very very offensive. Vox, which as you know is very woke and very left wing, wrote this in the aftermath of the shootings in Atlanta. Ultimately, there's a failure to remember what got America to this place of racial hierarchies and lingering black Asian tensions, white supremacy. White supremacy is what created segregation, policing, and scarcity of resources in low income neighborhoods, as well as the creation of the model minority myth, all of which has driven a wedge between black and Asian communities. I mean, this is fascinating that uh, this is Vox trying to address the reality, which is a a numbers-based reality, that the highest percentage of any group when it comes to attacks on Asian Americans comes from black Americans, uh, who, as we know, are about 12 to 15% of the U.S. population overall, and account for about 27% by the most recent statistics of attacks on Asian Americans. So here, Lauren, we have the Democrat left explaining to everybody that attacks on Asians from black Americans are also the result of white supremacy. Please, please explain that one. Well, it's nothing short of mental gymnastics, frankly. People want to blame white supremacy for black Americans attacking Asian Americans. Uh, I guess it's always white people's fault is is the main message I'm getting from 2021. But the reason they're trying to bring white supremacy into this is because as we know, the left does not like to um, hold any sort of accountability when it comes to black communities. It's it's very patronizing actually. If you listen to the progressive left talk, they, they treat these communities as if they're children with uh, no independent thought or will of their own. So in instead of trying to hold individuals accountable for their bad behavior, they would rather make this a systemic problem that has nothing to do with these communities itself. Um, This is not, you know, blaming white people is not going to improve relations between black and Asian communities. And I think if anything, it's just going to inflame tensions because I think what we're seeing now is this, this failure to hold the perpetrators of these attacks responsible. And if the left actually cared about Asians like they are pretending they do currently, they would want these people brought to justice regardless of their skin color. Here's what Democratic Representative Lee said about those Atlanta shootings. Play it. We have to remember hate speech leads to hate violence. And uh, listening to this type of hate for the last four years, it didn't just start recently, uh, has put the Asian uh, Pacific American community at risk. And we're now seeing uh, this uh, unfortunate uh, backlash uh, and unfortunate embracing of uh, Donald Trump's uh, overall agenda. Remember, uh, his agenda was based on white supremacy and the roots of all of this are white supremacy. Yes, it's Donald Trump's fault. This was being said last week, including the surge in attacks on Asian Americans, which have come 
uh, more so from the black community than any other one specific community. Donald Trump's fault, Lauren, that's what they tell us. Yeah, it's kind of strange and hard to believe uh, that Donald Trump's rhetoric would have had such a such an effect on the actions of these black attackers uh, who I'm just going to go out on a limb here and may not otherwise be the biggest supporters of Donald Trump. But we've seen this type of assertion from the left for years. Uh, no, it is not hate speech or racist to, co to correctly identify the fact that coronavirus came from China, nor is it anti-Asian to criticize the Chinese government. In fact, uh, where my family is from on my father's side, Hong Kong, uh, they're some of the biggest critics of the Chinese government. And I, I would find it very hard to call them racist or anti-Chinese. But if you ask me, this is just another way for the left to try to weaponize the allegation of racism, which we have seen them do for the past five years at least. Lauren, really appreciate you joining, sharing your perspective. Thanks so much. In the past, when they sent it over to us, Last time, it went into Mitch McConnell's legislative graveyard. The legislative graveyard is over. H.R. 8 will be on the floor of the Senate, and we will see where everybody stands. Nothing in H.R. 8 or H.R. 1446 violates any part of the Bill of Rights. It does not violate the First Amendment. It does not violate the right to due process, and it does not violate the Second Amendment. The House passed two bills last week that would tighten gun sales regulations and expand background checks. This is a new push by Democrats to enact the first major gun control law in more than two decades. Here to discuss a guy who could walk us through this backwards and forwards and all over again, Cam Edwards, editor of BearingArms.com. Cam, man, great to have you. Hey, Buck. Thanks so much for the invite, man. So let's start with this. People probably haven't even heard. I mean, I've been trying to get the word out about H.R. 1, which is basically the replay 2020 and then some so that Democrats win every election forever because there's no Voter Integrity Act. That's not what Democrats call it, but that's what it would be. H.R. 8, H.R. 1446 that deal with gun issues, Second Amendment issues, Cam. Tell us what's going on here. I, I, I bet most of the people watching haven't even heard about it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I've been surprised at the lack of uh, media coverage for these bills, given that they're the first part of Joe Biden's anti-gun agenda to get through at least you know one chamber of Congress. So HRA is a quote-unquote universal background check bill. Uh, and what this would do would require that every private transfer of a firearm, with limited exceptions, uh, be conducted through a federally licensed firearms dealer. So you'd have to find a gun store that would do these background checks. You'd have to drive there. Uh, if you're selling a gun to somebody, even if it's somebody you know, you'd have to do this. In fact, not only when you're selling a gun, if you're loaning a gun to somebody, so your buddy wants to take your rifle uh, on his hunting trip out west, well, you've got to go down to a gun store. Uh, your neighbor calls you and says, I'm worried that my abusive ex-boyfriend is going to show up at my door. You'd have to find a gun store that's open that late at night uh, in order for you to loan her a gun for self-defense. And Buck, if you violate this law, it is punishable by up to a year in federal prison and a $100,000 fine. Is there anybody who thinks that this is really substantially? Is there any data? I shouldn't say anybody who thinks because the left is crazy. Is there any data to substantiate that this would cut down on violence of any kind? This kind of additional background no. check? No, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, first of all, I think the bill is deeply flawed in a couple of ways. I think that it, it entraps otherwise would be legal gun owners, and it turns them into criminals. But at the same time, I have to admit, this bill is largely unenforceable. And it's absolutely unenforceable in terms of preventing criminals from getting a gun on the black market, because there's no way that the government can try to monitor every private transfer of a firearm. If they did so, we'd be living in a police state that you know makes China look like a libertarian paradise. So this bill has enforceability issues, but I also think it has some some real ideological issues because it is aimed squarely at legal gun owners and creating a crime out of thin air rather than actually focusing on the violent criminals, a much smaller subsection of the American population that's responsible for the rise in shootings and murders that we're seeing in so many cities right now. So, so I mean, this, this crime, to, to really deter violence in the way that they would, would seem to think or the, that they would propose, it would be if, if I'm willing to sell some, you know, if I'm going to sell somebody a gun 
uh, I would then have to go and get a background check done on, on that person. But if I wanted to sell somebody a gun who was a felon and I didn't care, I'm not going to do the background check anyway. right? So I, don't, I don't really understand. I mean, the way this works in different states is guys illegally go, they buy guns in a state where they can or they get them maybe illegally themselves. They, you know, they sell them out of their trunk to whomever they you know, get into contact with who wants a gun. They're not running background checks. So they're not going to run background checks on this either. So what's the point? Well, the point is for Democrats to be able to say they did something rather than actually something that works. And, and unfortunately, this is an issue that polls well because most people don't know the devil in the details. Now, in 2016, voters in Maine actually had the chance to approve or reject universal background checks, and they said no. They voted it down, 52-48, because they understood the problems in this bill. Uh, that same year, a background check bill narrowly passed in Nevada, like 50.1% of the vote. Uh, it did pass, but it was unable to go into effect because of the flaws in how the law was written. So, you know, the Democrats think that they can get political benefit out of this. But the thing that bothers me the most, honestly, Buck, beyond the attack on my Second Amendment rights, which at this point I'm almost numb to, it's the fact that violent crime is going up in a lot of cities in this country. And right. there are good people in bad neighborhoods who really do need help. And instead of delivering on proven, effective, targeted deterrence programs that actually focus on those violent offenders. These Democrats are offering a false promise to these people. They're lying to these people about what this bill will do, saying it will make them safer when it won't do a thing to help them or their children or their grandparents. This is a, this is a do something bill. We need to do something that works. You know, they're they're also pushing the emotional buttons on this. You can tell. I, I have yeah. a rule, Cam. You know, I talk about this on radio. Where anytime a Democrat, but particularly anytime Nancy Pelosi says it's for the children, we have to do this for the children. You should be very skeptical, right? Because she's trying to push those emotional buttons without making a fair argument. Here we go. Pelosi saying that these gun control bills, what exactly we're talking about, to protect our kids. Cam, play it. Drumbeat created by the people out there, the survivors of gun violence. We told them we're not resting until we get this job done. And as I say about these members of Congress, there's not, uh, if you're afraid to vote for gun violence prevention because of your political survival, understand this, the political survival of none of us is more important than the survival of our children. It's about, it's about the children, Cam. And if you're, if you, Oppose universal background checks. Nancy Pelosi wants you to know you don't care about kids dying. If this is if this is supposed to be a demonstration of caring about children, I mean, honestly, this is nothing more than apathy, if that's the case. Because, again, this will do nothing to prevent a single criminal transfer of a firearm. Nothing. And Nancy Pelosi knows it. And by the way, this is not a gun violence prevention bill. This is a gun control bill. The programs that I'm talking about, programs like Project uh, a Ceasefire, uh, the violence interrupters that we see that, you know, again, are working within those local communities. Those are true gun violence prevention programs. And I, as a Second Amendment advocate, see a lot of benefit to those because, again, they're targeted at the violent offenders. They're not about putting more gun control laws on the books. They're not about trying to criminalize aspects of the Second Amendment. Uh, can, and do, by do the you way, think, there can, are a lot of people on you, the do, left. Do, do you think yeah. they actually might get this done? I know the gun control groups are really lobbying the Senate hard to think that they can, you know, they, they do have a, a de facto majority. You think they can get it done? Well, I don't think they can get 60. So I think they're looking for ways to get 51. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just as with H.R. 1, it all boils down to Joe Manchin. It all boils down to Kristen Sinema. And it all boils down to the filibuster. Uh, if Democrats are convinced that, that this is their one shot to get their legislative agenda through, and so they're going to destroy every norm in the Senate to do so, uh, then yeah, not only, but here's the thing, but if that happens, this bill isn't the bill we have to worry about. Because yeah, I want to know what comes about, next. That was That's actually the question I was going to follow well, up as we can get right that, to that. that. What do you think, yeah. what are the crown jewels of the gun grabbers under this Biden administration if they decide to go for broke and get whatever they can done to restrict or eliminate Second Amendment rights? What are they going to try to do? Uh, you know, I think they're going to try to pass a, a gun ban. Uh, Biden, you know, Dianne Feinstein has already introduced a quote unquote assault weapons ban in the Senate, but it is not what Joe Biden proposed. 
What Joe Biden proposed was that if you own one of the guns that he doesn't want you to own, you would either have to hand it over to the government in a compensated confiscation scheme that give you a little bit of cash, you give them your guns, or you'd have to pay the federal government. You'd have to register your firearms under the National Firearms Act. And they promised once they knew where those guns were, they'd let you keep them forever and ever. Uh, that is what Joe Biden called for. And if they nuke the filibuster, if they can get legislation through with 51 votes, that's exactly what they'll try to do. Cam, appreciate you holding the line on this one, man. Thanks so much. And come back and talk to us because this is not going away, as you and I both know. Dr. Paul Schools, Dr. Fauci and Krispy Kreme Donuts is doing its part to promote the COVID vaccine. We got those stories in quick hits. Let's get right to it. If you watch this show, you know that I am a longtime outspoken critic of the tiny totalitarian known as Dr. Anthony Fauci. I think he's a Democrat. I think he's a partisan. I think he plays the political game very well. He's a bureaucrat, much more than he is even a man of science or a doctor. And he's been very harmful to the United States because he has been the excuse to shut down worthwhile policy discussion. I think he likes the power that he's had during all this. All of those things I've been very consistent on. And one area where you see him acting in a way that if you were really basing it on the numbers or the numbers, as Fauci says, uh, you would think it's absurd that he, who has already been fully vaccinated against this virus, goes out wearing not one, two masks. Dr. Rand Paul, also a senator, but an MD worth noting, asked him about this. And, and in the exchange, you see that Fauci doesn't like to be questioned about his absurd COVID virtue signaling. What Fauci won't tell you is that he's telling you a noble lie. He's lying to you because he doesn't think we're smart enough to make decisions. His fear is that if the vaccinated quit wearing the mask, the unvaccinated will say, what the hell, I'm not wearing a mask either. Right. So he lies to you to say, oh, the mask makes a difference, when in reality he knows better. He's wearing two masks for theater. It's complete theater. He is immune. He knows he's not going to get it, but he is not being honest with the American public. Fauci, to just review here, says that he initially lied to us at the beginning of the pandemic a year ago about how effective masks are because he didn't want us to take all the good masks from the healthcare providers. So he's already on the record. That, that's his explanation. Otherwise, he'd have to admit that what he said then, which is that masks for the general public don't really do very much, what he'd have to say then was true and, and deal with what he's been saying all along now, which is, would be untrue. No, he prefers the switch of, oh, I lied to you in the beginning. That's the official, that's not my interpretation. That's the official Fauci line. I said that something didn't work because I didn't want you to all go use it instead of the healthcare providers that I thought needed it more. So do you think it's a stretch at all, given that that is the on the record Fauci explanation that now he's telling people double mask even after you're vaccinated for any reason other than once people can start getting away with not wearing masks, people are going to stop wearing masks. They want control. They want everyone to do it. They want there to be no ability whatsoever to walk into a store or restaurant without wearing a mask. And more importantly, without mask shamers jumping all over you saying, even if you're vaccinated, you have to wear a mask like a bunch of lunatics that aren't very good at statistics. Uh, but at least Krispy Kreme is trying to do something nicer to get more people to get vaccinated. Starting today, guests who show a valid COVID-19 vaccination card at any Krispy Kreme shop in the U.S. can receive a free, iconic, original glazed donut anytime, any day, every day through the remainder of 2021. Get vaccinated. Get a Krispy Kreme glazed donut. Yummy. These things are quite good. I can't eat gluten anymore because I have celiac disease. But when I used to not have celiac disease, I would eat things like Krispy Kreme, probably too many of them. They are quite delicious. So if you're looking for yet another reason uh, to get the vaccine, Krispy Kreme is going to give you a sweet treat that comes in at a couple of hundred calories that, you know, worth it, I say. Remember when Joe Biden last week uh, had a little bit of a a tough time with the stairs. Here's what the video of it looked like. Joe Biden was going up. Now, Joe Biden is an older fellow. He's almost 80. I mean, he's, he's really getting up there. So when he falls and then falls and then falls again, now look, it's senior citizen falling on the stairs is not, it's not funny. 
It's, it's not something that, you know, but I, I know that people are all jumping on this. I, I want to point out that the reason I'm showing you this now is because when Donald Trump at West Point, you know, had a little bit of unsteadiness going down a ramp, it was ramp gate. It was Trump clearly has some, you know, malfunction in, in, a, in his pituitary gland or something or his amygdala or, you know, whatever. They make something up. Who cares? And so his brain doesn't work. So that's why he's falling down or he's senile or he can't, you know. They had all these stories about how Trump's health was clearly questionable because he slipped once walking down the stairs. And they said it wasn't slick, even though he said it was slick. They made it a big, and I mean the New York Times. I mean the big newspapers and liberal, uh, liberal outlets made a, made a big deal of it. So when Joe Biden does this, we have to hold him to the same standard. And also Joe Biden has had senior moments, and he does seem to be uh, in, a, in a period of decline. In fact, it would be strange if a man approaching 80 wasn't slowing down. So we, we have to reorient our thinking here because the Democrats are so... Uh, so deeply entwined with this lie that it's easy to let the gaslighting overtake your ability to think about this on your own. The guy's almost 80. Of course he's slowing down. Of course that's happening. But then again, Pelosi's almost, or, or Pelosi's almost 80, and Dianne Feinstein is way up there. You see some of these Democrats that are just clinging to power to the very, very end. It's a little gross, a little sad, a little weird, actually. Uh, and we had, oh, Jen Psaki responded, though, to stare gates. Play it. Just checking on the president. He uh, fell going up the steps to Air Force One on Friday. Is he doing okay? He's 100% fine. I don't know if you've been up those steps. They're a little tricky sometimes, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's doing Force great. One. There we go. Look, I'm happy Joe Biden's doing fine. I, 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 it's not funny watching an older person, older American, you know, take, take a fall on the steps ever. But the standard for the media has been all along that this is indicative of, uh, of when it's Trump, it's indicative of much broader problems. We have to talk about it. And they'll even, there was even a suggestion, a suggestion of, of a recklessness in voting for Trump because the guy's slipping down the stairs at West Point and what else do you have to know? And then Joe Biden, you know, wipes out basically on the stairs at, at Air Force One and we can't talk about it. If you talk about it, you're a bad person. It's almost like you're engaged in some form of elder abuse. So as we continue to see this problem, this situation, the double standard is something that Democrats, they don't even fight against that as a name. They don't care. The double standard just means they have power. The double standard means that they get to do what they want and we get to deal with the consequences of it. So in a sense, they revel in it. They actually really enjoy focusing on their ability to treat their team, their people one way, and our people another. And that's going to continue, and we have to fight against it. And that is uh, it for tonight's Hold the Line. The No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly is up next. Shields high.